Okay, so uh, we talked about energy-based models last, last week, and uh, I'm going to recap some of the stuff that we talked about uh, in the first few minutes and then um, you know, expand uh, on that, and then we'll talk about structure prediction in the second hour. Okay, so what we talked about last week mostly was uh, so-called contrastive energy-based running, right? So it's the idea that you have an energy function, uh, which in this notation is denoted E, but it should be called F, I apologize for that. Um, and this uh, energy function, the training of the, this energy function should be such that we give that the, the energy takes low values on training samples, uh, which are here symbolized by, you know, X, I, Y, I, okay? So training sample here, X, I, X1, Y1, X2, Y2, et cetera. So I put the collection of all the X's and all the Y's uh, together. Um, and, uh, and so we're gonna have a, a objective function that is gonna have the effect of pushing down on the energy of uh, those sort of individual data points. If our energy function is bounded below, uh, let's say by zero, because it's some sort of distance or something like this, um, that this will have the effect of, you know, pushing down to the floor, the energy of those, those good guys. Um, and contrastive methods work by explicitly pushing up on a set of other uh, points. Um, so for the same X's, but different Y's that are incorrect, we're gonna pick a bunch of those points and we're gonna push up on, on their energy, okay? So for this to work, this H function here has to be a increasing function of E of X, X1, Y1, E of X2, Y2, et cetera, okay? Has to be an increasing function of the energy of the correct points, because then when, we, when we're gonna minimize this loss function, this is, gonna, this is going to have the effect of pushing down on the energy of those points, okay? But it should be a decreasing function of the energies of the bad guys, so that when we minimize the loss, the energy of the bad guys is pushed up, okay? So I, I said decreasing and increasing, not strictly increasing, not strictly decreasing, because there is a point where perhaps we don't care anymore about pushing down the, uh, the energy of the good guys, and we don't care anymore about pu putting up the energy of the bad guys uh, if they are above a certain threshold. And this threshold we called M, okay? So uh, M may be uh, different for, for every pair uh, of, uh, of Y and Y, and y hat. Uh, and, you know, the, you have a lot of choices in, on, on how, you, how you pick that. Uh, here, M is actually a, a vector. So it's a vector of margins that you get for each, uh, each, y, each pair of, you know, Y, uh, y hat. Um, so this is sort of the general form of a contrastive loss. Uh, and I've, I've just said the, the property it should uh, respect, um, increasing function of E, decreasing function of, of, of E of X of the training samples, uh, decreasing function of uh, E of X and the bad guys, um, the well-chosen contrastive points, uh, and then some margin, okay? The margin may be explicit or implicit. And what you probably need is a, a margin, a separate margin for each pair, um, uh, you know, YI and your YI, YI hat. Okay, so there are two cases, right? There is the, the conditional form, uh, which is this when you have an X. So basically you have, you know, an input variable X and a variable to be predicted Y. And then the unconditional version, uh, which, you know, you can think of, a, of it as basically the same thing, except here, uh, we don't assume that one of the two variables is, is uh, observed. It could be observed or not observed. Uh, and uh, both variables are Y, essentially. So the, the formula is just translate directly, except we don't have an X, okay? Uh, we just remove the X's from the formula above and, and you're okay. <coughs> okay, so now we're gonna uh, dig a little bit more into what particular form uh, this uh, loss function can take. Uh, but before we do this, um, I, you know, I, I said earlier that there were two types of uh, energy-based training, the contrastive forms that we are talking about right now, and then the regularized and architectural forms that we haven't talked about yet. But I want you to keep this in mind, that there are two kinds of two ways of training energy-based models, uh, machine learning in general, actually, uh, the contrastive methods and the 
non-contrastive methods that you know can be called architectural or regularized depending on the situation. Um, so I put here a list of standard algorithms together with whether they belong to one category or the, or the other, whether they are supervised, unsupervised, structural prediction or whatever. Um, um, and you know, I'll, I'll show this slide again multiple times. So um, when we talk about some of those, uh, some of those examples. Okay, so what we talked about last, last week, I, which I showed this slide where, you know, what are particular forms of H that are, you know, popular or simple or appropriate. Um, and one particular specialized form is this form where you only have two samples in the loss function, okay? So you basically have one good guy and one bad guy, and your loss function only depends on that pair. Of course, for every training sample, you choose a different good guy and bad guy, right? I mean, the good guy comes from the training set, the bad guy you pick in, in some smart way, and here I'm not specifying how. Uh, and, and you may have a margin that depends on, uh, probably depends on the difference between Y and Y hat. Um, so particular instantiations of this type of, of so again, this needs to be a, an increasing function of uh, F of XY and a decreasing function of F of uh, XY hat, okay? And for this to work, uh, in every case, M needs to be uh, non-zero, positive and non-zero. Um, this ensures that when you minimize this, the energy of the bad guy will be larger than the energy of the good guy by at least M. Um, this does not need to be a hinge loss. It needs to be, you know, it can be anything, but hinge loss satisfies this condition. So simpler example is, is, is the one here, the kind of simple, uh, the simplest form where you, you, you say, I want f of x, y to be uh, zero or smaller, okay? So you put a, a hinge here that pushes this down towards, towards zero. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if the energy cannot, be, cannot go below zero, then this is just, you know, minimizing the energy, basically. Uh, and then the other term just pushes up on the energy of the bad guy until it's larger than m. Okay, so this is like a positive part, the ReLU. Uh, and this is obviously a decreasing function of F. Until M, until F uh, is larger than M of Y and Y hat, in which case it stops, okay? So this, you know, explicitly pushes down on the energy of the good guy, pushes down the energy of the bad guy, so that the energy of the good guy is zero and the energy of the bad guy is M. Here's another example. So this, this one only cares about the difference between the two energies. So it's not gonna try to make the energy of the good guy small. It's just gonna try to make the difference between the energy of the good guy and the bad guy larger than a particular margin. Okay, so this is uh, the so-called ranking loss or, 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 or hinge loss or sometimes triplet loss. Um, and it's, it's been, you know, it's been quite popular for some applications, but the fact that there is kind of no you know, pinning down of the absolute values of F may be an issue sometimes. Um, so here's a slight modification of the one at the top where we square the energy terms, right? So, uh, and it's, you know, depicted here on the, on the, on, on the, on the right, on the diagram. So the, the first term um, is the energy of the good guy and you're gonna square this. So you're gonna put it in a hinge and then you're gonna square the hinge. So you're gonna get an, a, a cost function that looks like looks like this uh, red curve here. It says, you know, I want the energy to be as close to zero as possible um, with uh, a square penalty. And then the other term is a square hinge uh, in the other direction with a margin, okay? So you have a margin here uh, and you pay a price for making this energy lower than the margin uh, and you pay a quadratic loss for, do for doing so um, uh, because of this square. Okay, if you didn't have the square, so if you use the, this objective function, those would be straight lines, okay? Um, and, you know, with the square, it may have better properties that like there is a, a, a equilibrium point between the, the, two, the two losses. Okay, so those are examples of very simple losses that are contrastive and they take only one pair of good guy, bad guy with a margin. Now, here is a long list of other uh, loss functions that people have used over the years in various contexts. They were not necessarily formulated as energy-based models, okay? Uh, some of them go back to the 1980s, okay? So this is not um, uh, a, new, a new problem that people have been dealing with. Uh, um, so 
we can interpret actually uh, all energy functions like the, the perceptron loss as actually in terms of uh, um, sort of an energy-based uh, model. I'm not going to go into the details of, of what this is. You probably have heard what a perceptron is. The main issue with it is that uh, its margin is zero, so it doesn't work in all conditions. Hinge we just talked about. Um, here is another uh, objective function. This one is very similar to the hinge, except it's a soft hinge. It's very similar to the kind of loss you, you use in logistic regression with uh, binary output. So here you take the energy of the good guy, compute the difference with the energy of some bad guy, uh, which is called Y bar here, uh, and then put this in a log of one plus exponential, which is basically a soft hinge, if you want. So it tries to make the this energy much smaller than that energy, because when that's the case, then um, uh, you, know, you will have a, a sort of negative exponent here, and and this this whole thing will basically go to zero. Okay, approach zero, uh, and then uh, for large values of the difference, the this this cost function basically is is like the is like the identity. It's like it's like the difference, right? So it's very much like the the hinge loss, except it's kind of a soft version of it, if you want. Um, I'm going to skip those other things. So let's go this this date from the 1980s, um, and and the main issue here is that there is no explicit margin. Uh, NCE. So this is very similar to uh, what we look at here, uh, except you know we don't take a log; we compute the inverse and we put a minus sign in front of the thing. This was used in the context of um, uh, speech recognition, mostly, actually. Square square I just mentioned. Square exponential is a, is a, a different play on it, where the way we push up on the uh, energy of the bad guys is that we plug them into a negative exponential. So they're being pushed to infinity, but with a, a quickly decreasing force, if you want. Um, because you know, as the energy of this bad guy grows, the, the, the cost becomes smaller and smaller and flatter and flatter. So we don't push it uh, very far towards, towards infinity. Uh, the the margin here is is infinite actually right because the system really push tries to push the energy of bad guy to infinity. Um, the second last line we've already seen this is the negative log likelihood which in the context of speech recognition people used to call uh, maximum return information uh, it's actually the same thing and uh, and there you have a term here that doesn't take into account a single bad guy but it takes into account all the bad guys all together. Um, so you integrate the the second term over all the bad guys, over all values of y, good guys and bad guys, okay, uh, and uh, plug this into a cost that will push up the energy of all the good guys and bad guys. But the force with which the good guys are pushed is less than the force with which they are pushed down. Uh, so overall, this will actually shape the uh, um, energy function in the right way, and we explained that last last week a little bit. Explained also that. Um, this may not be appropriate um, for various reasons. So, uh, so here is the advantage of, of energy-based models. You can come up with your own loss function. You're not bound to using something like negative log likelihood, which you are pretty much bound to if you're, if you're using probabilistic methods. So this opens the door to a lot more flexibility in the type of cost functions that uh, you allow yourself to use. Um, so I mentioned this briefly last week. Um, this is a, a, a sort of generalized additive margin loss where uh, you, you have a margin for a pair of, of samples, uh, which sort of makes, you know, a puts a competition between the, the good guy and the bad guy, if you want. Uh, but instead of just having one pair for every sample uh, X, Y that you see, uh, you sum over, all, over a set of possible pairs with, you know, a possible bad guys, essentially. Okay, so the cost function doesn't take a single uh, y hat. This should be y hat, not y check. I'm not sure why I put a y check here, uh, but um, but a whole bunch of them. Okay, and you combine them additively. Uh, but let's come back to this uh, idea that we combine the energies of all the all the good guys and all the bad guys together. Um, so. This has become kind of popular uh, for certain types of uh, certain approaches to particularly self-supervised learning over the last uh, few years. 
three or four years. Um, and a particular example of this is called Info NCE or some, what some people call CPC, Contrastive Predictive Coding. I don't like this term because uh, it's, it's too inclusive for a, a method that is very specific and uses a particular objective. Um, but the, the idea of using kind of, uh, so uh, the, most of those methods only have one good guy in the, in the loss, but a lot of bad guys and the bad guys come from a batch, right? So you train at the level of a batch, you a mini batch, you collect a bunch of samples with one good sample and a, and a bunch of negative sample, contrasted samples, so bad wise, okay, that you come up with somehow. And within this batch, you're going to push down the, on the energy of the good guy and then push up on the energy of the bad guys, but they may compete with each other, right? So a particular example of this is imagine that you put the, all the scores of all the bad guys uh, inside of a, uh, a softmax, basically, right? So here, the, the top here is, uh, uh, and I'm not sure I got the sign right. Yeah, no, I think it's correct. So you put the, the energy of the good guy uh, at the top, and then you divide by the sum of the energies of the good guys and all the bad guys, okay? So if the bad guys have very high energy, then this basically is negligible, and what you get is one, and your cost is zero because you take the log, right? Uh, but if the energy of the bad guys are, are too low, then this denominator matters, okay? And uh, their value, their, their energy is gonna be pushed up, uh, because you want to make this whole term, this whole sum, uh, small. Uh, you know, which means you want to make the the minus log of one over, which is a log of this, small. Okay. Um, so, what advantage does that give you? It 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 performs within a batch a technique called hard negative mining, which means uh, within a batch. The, the, the negative samples that are, going to get, that are going to get most of the gradients are the one whose energy is significantly smaller than all the other ones. So if in this batch of samples of bad guys, all of the bad guys have high energy, so you don't care about them, but one of them has low energy, because of this softmax, this guy is going to get all the gradient. It's going to be pushed up really hard, okay? Whereas the guys that already have high energy are not going to be pushed up very much. Um, so there is a, this sort of introduces some sort of competition between the uh, between the energies of the, the the various sample the various negative contrastive samples within within the batch. Um, so people now call this info NCE, and it's very popular for uh, training joint embedding systems. So let's talk about joint embedding uh, uh, architectures now. We talked about this last week. But let me come back to this. Um, so we have two networks. Uh, they can take uh, similar uh, inputs or, or, I mean, they can take inputs of the same nature, let's say two images, uh, or in other joint embedding methods, they can actually take uh, uh, you know, inputs of completely different nature. One could be, for example, an image. The other one could be a test query. And you want to train uh, the neural nets so that the vector representing an image and the vector representing a query that describes this image uh, or a question that people can type in a search engine or a caption for that image would have nearby embeddings. Uh, but if you have an image together with a query that doesn't match this image, doesn't correspond to it, you want the output representations to be far away from each other. Okay, but here we're gonna use the simple example where those two networks are identical. So they share the same weights. Okay, you have one single weight here that is shared across those two networks. Uh, so they produce embeddings for images. And what we want is you want the output vectors to be very close to each other, which means this distance measure should be low. That's the energy. So you want the energy to be low whenever the two images are essentially distortions of each other. They have essentially the same content, uh, perhaps uh, uh, slightly different due to cropping or scale or noise or rotation or things like this, right? You can artificially generate those samples, right? You take an image and you distort it a little bit and, and that's your X and Y positive pair. Um, so you run them through those networks and you, you tell those, those, uh, those two guys, uh, you know, minimize the energy, which means bring H and H prime as close to each other as possible. Now, if you only do this though, your system will collapse, right? So we talked about this last time. What's going to happen if you only have positive samples is that uh, 
your network will happily ignore the input and just output constant H and H prime. That's a collapse, an example of collapse. So contrastive methods will push up on the energy of other samples. So you pick another image that you know is different from, from, from the first one. Or maybe you don't know that it's different, but you rely on the fact that your training set is very large and you pick another sample and you assume it's different. Um, this is what people do. And you, you push it through the network and you tell the network, I want those two representations to be at least some distance away from each other. Uh, if you have multiple negative samples within a batch, you can plug th that into an info NCE uh, style uh, loss. Uh, or you can use just you know a ranking loss or or square square or square exponential one of the loss functions I, I showed you uh, earlier. Uh, so those different papers here that uh, are mostly from the last couple of years uh, use different tricks to to make this efficient. Uh, so uh, SimClear is kind of a, a one that used info NCE, uh, and uh, uh, it, it, it works okay, uh, but it's very expensive because you need a lot of those negative samples to be able to train the system to, to work, work properly. Uh, Perl and Moco use other tricks, which I'm not gonna go through right now. Um, I mean, you use negative samples, but they use tricks to make that more efficient and to kind of do the negative mining more efficiently. Um, and there's been sort of recent success in speech recognition, which I'll, I'll explain uh, just now. So. Uh, this is some work, very recent work from, uh, from Facebook from, from last year, I believe, uh, from tw uh, October 20, 2020, so it's very recent. And they used uh, essentially joint embedding, a joint embedding method to pre-train the speech recognition system with unlabeled data. So they had roughly about a thousand hours of unlabeled speech. And what they do is they run a convolutional net on the speech signal so the convolutional net outputs a, a sequence of vectors that represent the speech, if you want. And they use a criterion that, that, that says, uh, I want the representation of a particular segment of speech to be easily predictable from uh, what, sur what surrounds it, essentially. Okay, so that's a kind of, so basically you make the energy, which is the difference between the prediction from the neighbors and the, the current vector as small as possible. But they also use a contrastive phase where they substitute um, some of those samples, uh, the, the central sample by another one, uh, and then make that energy large. And so it's a little bit like uh, the masked, masked autoencoder idea that we, uh, uh, we mentioned uh, last week of, you know, you take, a, you take an input and you corrupt the, the input and you train the system to kind of recover the uncorrupted, except here it's more like a joint embedding method, but it has a little bit of the same flavor as the, uh, as the denoising autoencoder. So they used, um, uh, I mean, they used the masking here and they, they, they use a transformer on, on, on top of the convolutional net that extracts those uh, acoustic vectors to do this uh, sort of missing vector prediction, uh, if you want. Um, you know, it, it's, it's contrastive, but it's more akin to a denoising autoencoder uh, than, uh, sort of a, a joint embedding method. Um, so the result of this is that now with this representation, they can, with a representation that they learn through this process, uh, they can use this representation and train a speech recognition system with only 10 minutes of labeled data, uh, which is astonishingly small for any language and basically get the same word error rate as the previous state of the art from last year that was obtained with 100 hours of uh, labeled data. So that's an incredible reduction. Uh, this is really important because, uh, and it's sort of open source, um, it's really important because uh, if you're a company like Facebook or Google, you wanna be able to essentially recognize speech in any language spoken in the world. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of languages for which there is very little training data, labeled training data, and it's very expensive to label uh, speech data. You need to find, you know, uh, competent speakers of that language and, and, and then, you know, have them kind of uh, label. So, uh, um, so if you are able to reduce the amount of data that is required for, for training a speech recognition system, it's super important. But it's a question here. Yes. 
Uh, I wonder how wide the CNN needs to be for the for the masked prediction criterion to be useful. For example, if the window is too narrow, the prediction won't capture any of the semantics of the speech. Yeah, um, so the, this actually uh, is a funny kind of uh, uh, speech system that does not use a pre-processing. So it actually takes the raw uh, wave as an input, the just the, the samples. Okay, so there is no pre-processing that turns this into a time frequency representation, as is more common in speech recognition systems. This one works directly from the raw input. Okay, so the the first few layers of the convolutional net extract auditory features, if you want, from the uh, from the from the the raw signal, and then uh, the this representation vector Q, this acoustic representation vector that that you get. I'm I don't remember the details, the details, so I don't know you know, the, 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 the temporal separation between, between two of those output vectors. My guess is it's probably, you know, on the order of a few, a few tens of milliseconds, probably 20 milliseconds or something like this, but I, I'm, I'm not actually sure, I don't know. So it's enough to identify an elementary sound called a phone. Okay, the, the input window, so this is the displacement between two cues, but the window is of course larger because you need some context. For example, uh, if you look at the signal, the raw signal or the, the, the time frequency representation, with the sound P in APA uh, or in uh, EP or OPPO, right? The, the P actually is completely different. We hear it as a P, uh, but when you look at the, 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 the spectral uh, representation of, that, of the sound at that moment, it's completely different uh, because of the context. Uh, so, you need some context to be able to interpret uh, an elementary sound. The sound itself may last, you know, a fraction of a second, maybe, uh, you know, 100 milliseconds or less. But you need some context around it to be able to recognize it. So that's why the, 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 the convolutional net has a window. But I, I wouldn't be able to tell you, you have to look at the paper, uh, really what the architecture is and what the input window is. Okay, so this is you know recent progress uh, due to those contrastive methods, which uh, really is, I mean, makes a big difference in, in the world. Um, uh, even better, you can use those techniques to train uh, a speech recognition system that is multilingual. So now, instead of training a speech recognition system that only recognizes one language, you pre-train it in this self-supervised uh, contrastive manner on lots of languages, I think, uh, you know, on the order of 100 or something, uh, or 10, it depends on the experiment. And, uh, and the system kind of learns a good representation for language regardless of which language it is, uh, including tonal languages like uh, Mandarin uh, and, uh, you know, stressed languages like English or completely non-stressed languages like French. Um, and then you take that representation and you can train, uh, you know, a, a recognizer on any number of, uh, uh, of languages. And, and, and it's interesting that, you know, when you look at, when you do some sort of low dimensional visualization of the representation that is uh, extracted by the, by the system, those Q vectors, and you can uh, do this for different languages, you clearly see different categories of languages where, um, you know, Mandarin and, and you know, uh, other uh, uh, languages um, of, of the same type, tonal languages are kind of in one cluster. And then you have uh, uh, languages here that are kind of Germanic, if you want, and, you know, with a tinge of uh, uh, Romance uh, here. Um, Arabic and Kabyle are, are kind of different. And then you have the, the sort of uh, sort of Latin derived uh, languages uh, down here. Not Basque, actually. Basque is not even Indo-European, so it's in the category of it by itself. Uh, Basque is the language spoken in southwestern France and north, north, uh, northeastern Spain. And nobody knows how to classify this language. <laughs> it doesn't belong to any big family. Probably most of you have heard about gener generative adversarial uh, networks. This is uh, a technique that people use to generate images. And we may talk about this uh, uh, in a future lecture, at, you know, some length, but in fact, again, is secretly a contrastive method for energy-based models. Okay. Um, so what is again? So again, uh, so I'm not going to describe kind of the usual description of GANs. What I'm going to tell you now is 
uh, an idea. So we need a way of picking the negative samples whose energy we're going to push up. Okay, and we can push up at random places, but in high dimensional space, right, pushing up on random places is not going to get us anywhere. So we're going to be we're going to have to be really smart about how we pick those negative samples whose energy we're going to push up. And perhaps a good idea would be to pick those samples that are not training samples, but yet have low energy, right? This is something, this is the hard negative mining issue that I was telling you about earlier. So we'd like the, the, the samples, you know, the, the Ys whose energy we're gonna push up to be given currently low energy by our model because they are wrongly being given low, low energy, okay? So we pick a sample that currently has a low energy and we push it up. Again, the problem with this is that there may be, you know, an infinity of those in a high dimensional space, they may be hard to find. So here's an idea. We're gonna train a neural net to tell us where they are, okay? We're gonna train a neural net to generate those green points. Uh, and in the context of, again, that's called a generator. So think, uh, so again, is a system that has two networks. It has a generator, which is a neural net. It takes as input a bunch of random variables, a vector of random variables that you, you draw from a distribution. Um, and this, this generator network is going, is going to produce a, a green point. So it's going to be trying to produce a point which our energy-based model gives, currently goes, gives low energy to, but should be given high energy. Okay, and so we're gonna take a Y from our data, our data set, uh, run it through our energy-based model, which could have any architecture. Here I draw it as an autoencoder, but it could be anything, okay? Something that outputs a scalar. And we're gonna push down on the energy of this because that's a data point, okay? That's a, a, blue, a blue dot. And then we're gonna generate one of those green dots and then pull up on the, uh, on the corresponding energy, right? So that we're gonna shape the energy function in the right way. Uh, now, how do we train this generator? So the way we're gonna train this generator is that um, we're gonna say, uh, how can I change the weights of the generator in such a way that next time around, when I generate a Y, this Y will be given a low energy by my energy-based model, okay? Because we want to generate green points that actually are close to the manifold of data so that when we push it, the, the, the energy takes the right shape. So we need to find a green point that our model gives low energy to. And the way we do this is we train the weights of this network so that we train it to produce points here such that those points are given low energy by our current energy-based model. We can do this easily, right? We, uh, we, uh, we have a Y here that our generator just, just produced from a random vector. That's an image, let's say. We run through an energy-based model, it gives us an energy, and then we back propagate the gradient of the energy uh, in this network. Okay, and we back propagate again the gradient through this network. And with that gradient, we update the weights of this generator network so that uh, the new Y that's gonna be generated after this update has a lower energy than the old Y, the old Y hat, okay? So basically this generator trained itself to be adversarial, which is why it's called generative adversarial networks, um, in the sense that it trained itself to produce the, 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 not just bad guys, but the worst guys possible that are most annoying for the energy-based models. These are examples that, to which our energy-based model gives low energy, uh, but should not have low energy, okay? So, uh, so that's the story, essentially. It's a contrastive method where we train a neural net to produce the negative samples, okay? It's basically as simple as that. Uh, so, uh, so basically there's two phases. You give a data point, you run through your energy-based model, then you back propagate through the energy-based model and take a gradient step with respect to the parameters of, of the energy-based model so that the energy goes down for that data point. And then you run, you, you, you generate random, uh, random vector, run it through your generator network, produce a sample, mm -hmm run this through the, uh, your energy-based model. It's called, it used to be called a discriminator. People prefer now the, the word critic for this, for this thing, but it's really an energy-based model. Then backpropagate the gradient of this energy uh, through the energy-based model and back through the weights of the generator 
and then change the weight so that this uh, energy goes down. Okay, so that the y hat that will be generated from the same vector next time uh, will actually be given a lower energy by the uh, by the energy based model. So you basically move the green points so that you know they get closer and closer to the the low energy region, and you keep pushing up on them. Um, now you can use this process to train an energy based model, which you know then you can use for whatever application you want. You could think of this as a self supervised free training, although it doesn't work very well if you do this. Um, but what people do is that they actually drop the energy based model, they drop the critic, uh, and they use the generator as a way of generating images. So now what you have is a model that, for which you know you give it a random vector drawn from a particular distribution, and out comes a, an image that basically looks like the you know the the images that you had in your training set. It doesn't need to be an image; it could be any any piece of data. So it's a way of you know kind of you know training a, a system to uh, to generate. You can interpret the energy based model as uh, as a critic, which is a, a way of telling the generator your sample looks good or looks bad. Okay, the energy based model basically just rates the the generated sample. Um, and 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 tells the generator whether it's good or bad. Uh, now the original formulation of GANs uh, actually was kind of more probabilistic than this, and actually didn't quite work very well. And what people did over the years, like uh, this this paper by Archowski and Botu and and a few others, uh, Archowski was actually a PhD student at NYU. Um, you know, Botu is affiliated with NYU um, and and Facebook Air Research in New York. Um, so this is the idea of Wasserstein GAN, and Wasserstein GAN is a essentially a technique to make sure that whatever energy function is being computed by this is kind of smooth, if you want. So it doesn't, you know, because with this uh, technique, uh, if you're not careful, the the generator will will generate images that are more and more realistic. So the green points are going to get closer and closer to the to the blue points, and if you're not careful, the energy function will basically, you know, turn into a canyon. Right, it's going to have low energy just for your training samples, and then super high energy just outside of it. And you want to prevent this from happening, so um, so you can sort of regularize the the slope, if you want, of the energy function, and that's basically what Wasserstein GANs do. And it's pronounced Wasserstein because it's Russian. Uh, there is a question. Have, you, yes, go ahead. Uh, you know, I have also heard that there were secretly probabilistic models as well, the GANs. So one of the problems I heard of GANs is mode collapse. Uh, the generator keeps outputting the same green point. A solution I heard is um, to have the generator make like five samples and have the critic judge the set. If they are all the same, it is obviously fake to the critic. The generator is creating samples from the domain PDF. A mini batch should have a similar PDF, which kind of makes sense. Yeah. How do you view right. this from an energy point of view? And is why would making more samples in a set good from an energy-based model viewpoint? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of problems with GANs. Okay, so first of all, because you're doing this dual optimization uh, of, of two networks that are basically against each other, uh, the, what, what, what the optimization actually does is not a minimization or maximization, but it tries to find a kind of saddle point, or more precisely, what's called a Nash equilibrium. Uh, and if you use kind of standard optimization methods, uh, like, like, you know, stochastic gradient descent without being careful, uh, you can prove actually that you may not be able to find to converge to a Nash equilibrium between those two networks. Uh, one is going to win and is going to kill the other one, basically. So that's, you know, what happens with mode collapse. Now, what happens with uh, normal GANs in the original formulation is that if you trend them for a particular time, you're going to get some reasonable solution. If you trend them for very long, you're going to observe this mode collapse. And the mode collapse essentially uh, is, is, is one in which you know, the, the, the discriminator basically doesn't give you any useful gradient because it's got very large weights and it, uh, you know, basically its function is some sort of canyon. And, so, and, and the generator, because it doesn't have any useful gradient, basically keeps uh, producing the same output. Um, and, and so that's kind of a failure mode. And essentially, if you train uh, again in its original formulation for, for long enough, you'll observe this. Okay, so you have to stop training before it happens. So all those techniques, uh, you know, there's a lot of tricks for this, but Wasserstein GAN is basically a way to prevent this from, from happening uh, 
too early, but you still have the problem that you're trying to find a Nash equilibrium between two functions. You're optimizing, uh, you know, uh, you're minimizing two criteria, you know, you, you have two separate loss functions, right? One which is minimized by the, the weights of the, of, of the critic, another one that's minimized by the weights of the generator. And those two different uh, objective functions, um, you know, which is the, the positive and negative terms in the, in the hinge, if you want, uh, need to find, you know, they, they're not compatible with each other, right? So they're not, you know, it's always a trade-off, right? If, if you want green points that are really close to the blue points to have high energy, it means that your energy function has to be very steep and uh, this may not be good. And so this drives the system to a bad energy function, in fact, if, if you do it properly, right? So the, the criterion is bad, right? So you need to regularize uh, the, 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 the critic function, the energy function, so that it's smooth and doesn't, doesn't go, you know, go to hell, essentially. Um, uh, or, or you need to use other tricks. And there are literally hundreds of papers on how to make this work, but it's very finicky. Uh, the applications of GANs, so, so here's something. The application of GANs to, to pre-training in an unsupervised manner, an energy-based model, in such a way as to generate good features for a subsequent uh, supervised phase has been essentially a complete failure. There's been uh, essentially no success of using GANs as a technique to pre-train uh, a system uh, uh, self-supervised. The only success of GANs have been in, in, in content generation, image generation, sound synthesis, things like that. For that, it works, but that's the generator you use for that. Okay, as a way to train an energy-based model, doesn't really doesn't really work. Okay, so those non crochastic methods. Um, so there was uh, an idea that um, it came out of uh, came out of a paper called Moco, uh, which I mentioned earlier by Kaming He from from Facebook and, and his collaborators, and uh, and the idea was to you know basically kind of slow down the weights of one of the two networks in a Siamese uh, joint embedding architecture. So this is a situation where you have two identical networks. So they take, uh, they both take images, for example, and you make the weights of one of the networks slightly different from the weights of the other one. And the way you make it different is by essentially computing an average of the past weight vectors of, of that network. Okay. Uh, and the, the technique is called MOCO because it means momentum, uh, uh, encoding. Um, so there's, you know, basically a momentum uh, embedded in this weight, so that the weights of the two networks are slightly different. And if you if you add, uh, uh, so there's kind of various ways of doing this. In fact, I have a chart here. Um, uh, Moco doesn't appear here because it's it's been sort of largely outdated in the in the last year or two. Uh, but so these are uh, so SimClear is a Contrastive method, um, which I described before. Uh, and those other methods are, are non-contrastive. Um, actually, since CM to some extent is, but, uh, but BYOL and SWAV are essentially non-contrastive methods. Uh, so let me talk about BYOL. Uh, that means bring your own latent or bootstrap your own latent. This came out of DeepMind, um, a long list of authors here, uh, fairly recently. And um, when the paper appeared, Nobody knew why this was working, including the authors themselves. Okay, so they use this this trick of averaging the the weights uh, over time for one of the networks over the the previous one. But then the other trick is that they add uh, a layer or a couple layers on top of the the encoder um, that is supposed to basically swallow the difference, eliminate the difference of the representation between an image and a distorted version of it. Uh, and if you train the system with appropriate batch normalization at, at uh, all the layers, particularly in the last layer here and within the, within the encoder, it works without having to rely on negative samples. Why does it work? It's not clear. It's still a topic of research, uh, but it's really exciting because now you can train uh, joint embedding methods without a contrastive phase, which usually is very expensive. Now, uh, Simultaneously, uh, people came up with, uh, so these are uh, people at Facebook Air Research uh, uh, collaborating with uh, INRIA in, in France at Fair Paris. 
uh, and and you know Swav can be seen as a successor of Deep Cluster. And uh, so this is another technique which you know I'm not, I will not go into the details of, but essentially the idea of of, uh, of Swav is uh, you run uh, two images through the through the encoder. Uh, those are identical encoders, uh, and then you 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 basically perform a clustering on the uh, uh, algorithm vectors, and you normalize those those vectors in a particular way called synchron synchron uh, knob. So that it's a matrix, and you kind of normalizing in a funny way, uh, and then you 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 basically use the the clusters learned this way from for one of uh, an encoder as targets for the other encoder. Um, I realize my explanation is not very detailed. I encourage you to read the paper if you're interested. This is a very hot topic. Uh, there was actually a blog post that was uh, made just last week by Facebook that describes a large system that was trained using Suave and that beats uh, some record on uh, on image net recognition. Um, the details are, are important if you want to implement it and it's open source so you can you can download it, but um, uh, in a library called Vissel, V-I-S-S-L, that just came out. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, it, it basically quantizes the, the 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 set of output vectors into prototypes, and then it uses the prototypes as targets to train the network. But but you take the prototype of one network and the prototype of another network, and you swap them. That's why the SW in the in the name comes from. And then you use those as targets to train those two those two networks. Um, So it's an exciting new area because uh, those systems, uh, non-contrastive uh, methods for training joint embedding uh, actually are performing really well for uh, learning you know, new representations of, uh, of images. Um, in fact, here is one uh, that uh, I worked on with uh, some of my colleagues at Facebook that actually just appeared on the archive last week. So this is very fresh, but the, the field, this field is moving so fast and it's so exciting that a lot of people are kind of jumping on it. Um, and it's the idea of using joint embedding uh, with a very simple criterion. It's much simpler to understand than, than SWAV or, or, or BYOL. Uh, so here what you do is you run distorted versions of the same image through two identical neural nets, okay? They're really identical. You get two representations. And what you do now is you compute the you do this over a batch, let's say, and over this batch, you compute, you compute the cross-correlation matrix uh, between the, those sets of vectors, right? So you take ZA, which is a vector, you take ZB, which is another vector, you compute the outer product of those two vectors, uh, actually it's like that. So you get, um, you get a matrix, you do the sum of that matrix over uh, all uh, samples in your batch, and you get a matrix like this, okay? So I lied a little bit, um, which is that before you, you take those vectors, you subtract the mean of those vectors, uh, and you 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 normalize the the components by their variance. So what you get when when you do this outer product and sum, you get what's called a cross correlation matrix between uh, uh, two sets of vectors. Um, and the criterion to train it is to make this cross correlation matrix as close as possible to the identity. Okay. So what you want is you want uh, one variable in ZB and, and the same variable in ZA to be as correlated as possible to basically have correlation one, okay? So the correlation is the sum over the batch of the product of the values of the, the two components, okay? And this is all divided by the, the product of the standard deviation of the two, the two variables for normalization. Uh, so it's a value between minus one and one. One if the two values are completely correlated, minus one if they are anti-correlated, and zero if they are kind of uncorrelated, okay? So, uh, okay, so you try to make the diagonal terms uh, as, co as correlated as possible, which is another way of saying I want ZA and ZB to basically be the same vector. Now, there is an easy way for the system to cheat though, which is to make every component of ZA equal or essentially very dependent on each other and every component of ZB also equal. So, the, you know, basically there'll be very little information in Z, both ZA and ZB because, you know, all the components of the vector will vary at the same time. It will satisfy the, the criterion for the diagonal, but will not give you any particularly interesting uh, features. So there is another term that says, I also want one component from ZA to be decorrelated from an, a different component from ZB, okay? 
So I want, I want them to give me different information, essentially. Okay? And that's done by trying to minimize, to set the value of the off-diagonal terms to zero. Again, they can vary between minus one and plus one because it's a normalized correlation coefficient, but we try to make them zero. Uh, so that's easy to understand. It doesn't collapse. There's no negative samples, although you could think of the off-diagonal terms as some sort of weird way of uh, doing negative samples, but, um, but it's over the dimension of the representation, not over the dimension of a batch or a training set. Uh, and this works really well. It works basically just as well as swap, more or less. Does it work for medical images? Uh, we haven't tried because, you know, the paper came out a few days ago. <laughs> so there was only experiments with uh, data sets like, uh, you know, uh, pre-training on ImageNet and then, um, you know, testing on things like Pascal VOC, Coco, and things like that. And finally, the, the batch size, 1,024, is it too large for actually normal people to train? Someone is asking or is actually uh, doable? No, that's completely doable. Um, you can do this on you know, maybe you need multiple GPUs, but you don't need that that many. Um, and in fact, that's the optimal. So um, uh, Yuri and, and Lee, those authors, you know, tried with several sizes of batch size and, you know, below 1024 it's worse and above it's also worse, which is not the case for things like, uh, like Suave and BYOL. They, they work better if you have bigger batch size. Um, um, so this one, go to a maximum at 1024, which is kind of a good sweet, sweet spot. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, here's another example. So again, this was the topic of a, a blog post last week. Um, I believe uh, Thursday, mo Wednesday morning or something. Um, it's a system called SEER and it's basically a, an application of SWAV, a large scale application of SWAV. So you, you take 1 billion images randomly selected from uh, uh, Instagram Okay, this is really random, right? You, you just watch Instagram for a few hours and you get a billion samples, all right? Um, and then you, you train a SWAV system uh, using the RegNet architecture. So this is a particular family of uh, conv convolutional net, ResNet-like architectures uh, with a, you know, a particular set of parameters. And, and you, know, you can parameterize the sizes of the, of the layers and everything. So they use this sort of class of architectures and you know, train Regnets of various sizes with you know different numbers of parameters, pre-trained in self-supervised learning using Suave um, uh, on this, and then you take the resulting network, you you stick a classifier on top, um, you 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 take the representation in one of the layers and you stick a classifier and you train that uh, system supervised. There's two modes: one in which you just train the classifier, one in which you fine-tune the entire network. I think those are numbers for fine-tuning the entire network. You can get 84% correct on the uh, ImageNet when you when you train on the full uh, ImageNet uh, supervised. This is top one correct uh, number, uh, and it's still about 78% for when you only use 10% of ImageNet uh, label samples, and still about 60% when you use only 1%. So this is, you know, about 13 images per sample per ca per category. I'm sorry, there's a thousand categories in ImageNet, 1.3 million training samples. So 1% is about 13 samples per category. It's actually not balanced between all categories. So a very small number of samples per category, you still get 60% on the validation set, which is pretty amazing. And what's more interesting is that, so it works, it actually beats the state of the art in some other uh, 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 data sets. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, if you train purely supervised from scratch on ImageNet, uh, you don't get the same performance. You get something like, in the same conditions, you get a little more than 81% correct. Okay, this is under the same condition. Uh, and this is with the pre-training. So here the pre-training is basically just a way of initializing the weights of, uh, of the RegNet network. Uh, and this curve is for different size networks, right? So uh, after a certain size, purely supervised running kind of saturates, but the self-supervised running keeps going up. So uh, this is, you know, this this idea, which is very strange for, you know, classical statisticians in deep learning, which is that the bigger you make the networks, uh, the better they work. Uh, this one has 1.3 billion uh, parameters, which is quite large for for a continent. Okay, now let's switch to uh, 
the the topic of using latent variable models for in practice for structural prediction, which is really what uh, you're going to need to hear about for the next uh, next homework in particular. Um, okay, so the general problem here of uh, structural prediction is that you you have an input, let's say an image or a piece of text or speech signal or whatever, and the the uh, the output would be a structured object. So, for example, it wouldn't be just a category of the dominant object in the image, uh, but it would be, for example, a description of the image, if it's an image, or it would be a list of objects that are in the image, um, which you know is somewhat structured, like you have to decide like which, which object am I, gonna, am I gonna list in that list. Uh, if it's a translation system, it's you know a particular translation of the sentence, and of course there are multiple possible translations, uh, but it's a structured object, right? It has to satisfy grammar uh, in the target language, uh, et cetera. Um, and you know, it could be another image if you want to do image denoising, for example. Uh, it could be another, it could be an image if the input is a video clip and you're trying to do video prediction for things like, let's say, compression. Uh, so basically, it's when the output uh, is, you know, can be multimodal. So there could be multiple outputs that are all compatible with the input. Uh, and at the same time, the output is structured. Okay, so what you need for this is a latent variable predictive model that we, we talked about before, right? So uh, basically the architecture in which the set of possible answers is parameterized by a latent variable that you can vary, okay? And as you vary the latent variable, the prediction varies, hopefully if the system is properly trained over all the plausible uh, outputs that are that correspond to the input, okay? So the input is a, uh, sentence in Turkish and, you know, uh, the output would be a translation in English. And when you vary the latent variable, you, you vary the different style of translation, basically, but you preserve the meaning. That would be an example. Um, okay, so what we've seen about latent variable models is that uh, the way you do inference is that you, 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 you give an X and you give a Y, uh, Let's say during training, you know why, so you're given why, or you're given a proposal of, of why during test. And what you do is that you're finding the Z that minimizes the energy function, okay? That's the way uh, you proceed. If you don't know why, if you are inference time, you jointly minimize the energy with respect to Z and Y, okay? So you try to find the combination of Z and Y that minimizes the energy, and the corresponding Y is the best scoring uh, output, if you want. Um, here is a simple example. So this is a, a system by Nicolas Carillon, who is actually a postdoc at NYU right now, uh, but he did his work during his PhD in Paris. Uh, he was actually at Facebook uh, during his PhD. And it's called the Dieter system. It's probably one of the best performing vision system systems at the moment. It uses a, com a combination of convolutional net, neural net and uh, a transformer. Um, which is a particular architecture we haven't talked about yet, but uh, uh, you, you'll know more about this uh, later. Uh, and this transformer basically outputs a set of uh, predictions, uh, of, you know, kind of boxes for where there might be objects together with um, kind of a, a score for different categories. And then, what, you know, what, what, what you need a transformer to do is, is, to, is to give a list of high scoring, you know, well-identified objects uh, together with their, their energy or their score. But here's the problem. When you train, you give a list of objects that are in the image, but then you need to map the list of objects that comes out of the, of the neural net with the list of objects that is uh, uh, given to the, to the system for supervision. And you don't know which is which. So you have to basically try to find a good permutation of the list of objects produced by the system that can best matches the, the label that is being given to the system during supervised running, okay? That permutation is a latent variable. It's a discrete latent variable, but it is a latent variable, okay? So you find, so basically by finding the permutation that best matches which objects come out of the neural net with the list of objects that you give for supervision, you're performing a minimization with respect to a latent variable. Uh, so in fact, the, the, the permutation is not actually a permutation because there could be objects that are present that your system uh, proposed that are not 
in the list of desired uh, objects. Okay, so you might allow the system to drop some of the uh, some of the objects, and vice versa. They could be missing objects that your system didn't pick out, but they are in the list of desired objects. Okay, so it's not exactly a permutation you need. It's called you know bi bipartite matching. Um, but there's an energy function you can come up with that will kind of you know um, give you the best the best match with the minimum number of deletion and, and addition essentially. Um, so that's you know a very simple example of a energy based latent variable model where the latent variable is really very close to the output, uh, and that system works amazingly well. So you know you 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 run a image through a, a, a convolutional net that. The output of it goes to a transformer. Each of those uh, are basically slots for objects. Uh, a property of the transformer is that it's equivalent to uh, permutations of the input. So you can permute the input. You will get an identical result, uh, but the, the output will also be permuted. So the same way that a convolutional net is equivalent to shift. If you shift the input, the output shifts. Here, if you permute the input, the, ad, the output also is permuted, but otherwise unchanged, OK? And I'm not going to explain the internal structure of it. Um, and then you run through a second transformer that basically proposes candidates for output uh, uh, objects and, and, and classes, and that's where you do the matching with the, with the category. Um, you can train the system to produce masks also for whatever is important, and, and this works really well, and you can do semantic segmentation with it. I'll, I'll spare you the details, but um, this is one of the best performing uh, you know, computer vision systems uh, today. Okay, but let's talk. You know, let's talk about uh, latent variable model a little more uh, generally, or about structure prediction a little more generally. Um, so here is an example um, where we don't actually have latent variable, but we do have structure prediction. So let's say we have uh, three energy terms. Okay, so we have an input. Let's say it's a sentence from a text. Okay, that input goes into three different energy energy terms, and the output is a sequence of let's say words. Okay. And let's say we want the sequence of words to satisfy a grammar. And it's a very simple grammar in this case, which would be that uh, if, you know, if Y1 uh, is a particular word, then Y2 can be another list of possible word. And if we want to pick another word for Y2 that is not in this list of potential words that can follow Y1, then we need to pay a price for it. Okay, so this energy term will basically measure whether uh, a word Y2 can follow a word Y1. Okay. For example, if I start the sentence, it is obvious, and I stop, you can predict that the next word is probably something like probably that. Okay, is obvious that. Um, so, in this case, uh, you know this word would be obvious, right? And there would be a low energy for uh, following obvious with the word that, but probably a high energy uh, for the following word to be. Uh, lion. Okay, you never see it is obvious lion, right? That's kind of grammatically strange. So, uh, so this term here will basically implement what's called uh, a bigram, uh, a bigram language model, which uh, you know tells you for a pair of successive words what's the uh, c incompatibility between those two words. Okay, in terms of an energy function. Um, and you do this, you know, you assume the sequence here has four words, and you do this for every pair of successive words. Okay, so now I give you an X, I run, you know, inside of those boxes, there might be complicated neural nets or whatever. Uh, but my output here has to satisfy this constraint in the, uh, of the energy that successive words need to be compatible with my language model. Okay, that's kind of the purest example of structure prediction. Okay. And you need uh, the formalism of energy-based models for this because the only way you can find the good combination of Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4 is by actually minimizing the overall energy with respect to the Ys, okay? Uh, so you're gonna find um, through some search technique, uh, a combination of words that minimize the energy. Now, because words are discrete objects, there's ways to do this efficiently, which I'm gonna go to in a, in a second. Uh, so inference might be relatively simple and efficient because we uh, because words are discrete objects. So this is uh, 
you know, very much used in a lot of natural language processing, uh, speech recognition, handwriting. So in speech recognition, the process that does this is called a decoder. Um, and you know biological sequence analysis and and things like this. So anything where you have sort of you know a strong dependency between the variables you're trying to predict. So here is a, an example of of how you would do if efficient inference uh, in a such a energy based model, um, where for example you have constraints over pairs of successive variables. Uh, so here um, I'm. And I've drawn a very simple form of energy-based model where you have two latent variables, Z1, Z2, uh, two output variables, Y1, Y2. Okay, and you have a factor between successive uh, values and X only influences the first two, okay? X is a continuous variable, could be an image or audio signal or whatever. Uh, Z1 is binary, so just zero or one. Z2 is binary, uh, Y1 is binary, and Y2 is ternary, so you can take three values, okay? so. One thing I can do is exhaustive search. I can say, well, there's two values for this, two values for that, two values for that. So that's two, four, eight, and three values for this. So that's 24 values total, okay? So I can just go through all 24 combinations of values of uh, latent variables and outputs. And, and for each of those, I'm gonna compute the energy, okay? And uh, what that means is that, you know, I'm going to have to run through this energy-based model 24 times with 20 different combinations of inputs, which means, you know, if you assume that each of those uh, terms uh, cost the same to compute, I'm going to have to compute 24 times four energy terms. Okay, that's 96. Now it's kind of stupid because I'm going to compute the same value multiple times because there's multiple combinations of inputs for which both Z1 and Z2 are zero. And I can pre-compute the value of this uh, energy for the combinations Z1 and Z2 equals zero, okay? And I can pre-compute the same for this term. I can pre-compute the four values that correspond to uh, Z2 equals zero, Y1 equals zero, Z2 equals zero, Y1 equals one, Z2 equals one, Y1 equals zero, and, and Z2 Y1 equal, both equal one, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pre-compute, so this guy can take two values because Z1 can take two values and X is fixed. So this guy can take two values for Z1 equals zero or one, okay? This guy can take four values because Z1 and Z2 are binary. This one can take four values as well because Z2 and Y1 are binary. And this way can take six values because Y1 and Y2, uh, because Y1 is binary and Y2 is uh, ternary. So I pre-compute those, those values, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna put those values in a graph, okay? So uh, I start from the left here and then Z1 can be either zero or one and if, uh, if Z1 is zero, then I pay the price uh, EA of X zero, which I'm gonna put, I'm gonna attach to this uh, branch, okay? And if Z1 equals one, then I'm, I'm gonna put the value here that I pre-computed for this term uh, when, the, when Z1 is equal to one, okay? Um, then I'm gonna, um, then, you know, Z2 can be zero or one, and those are two nodes in my graph, but the transition, I can go to Z2 equals zero or one from either Z1 equals zero or Z1 equal one. And I'm gonna label each transition with the cost of, of that guy for the combination of Z1 and Z2, right? So if Z1 and Z2 are both equal to zero, then I label this uh, transition by the cost coming out of this energy uh, for Z1 and Z2 equals zero. Okay, and I can keep doing this, right? Now for why, why two being ternary, I have three values for this, zero, one, two, and I have transitions from you know, the two values of Y1 to the three values of Y2, and then a final uh, node. How do I do the minimization of the energy with respect to the combination of Y1 and Y2? So basically the combination is when you go through this graph and you follow a particular path, okay, and you add up the energies along the path, right? So I, I start with zero, I add up this cost, I get here, then I take this transition, add, up, add this cost, I get here, then add this cost, I get here, then add that cost and I get there, and, and then, you know, I'm done. So what I've done is implicitly computed the, the energy for, uh, for one, zero, one, zero, okay? By just summing up the, the cost along the path. 
So to do the inference, which is to minimize the energy both with respect to Y and Z, I just need to find the path in this graph that has the lowest cost. And of course, we know how to do this. This is a, you know, uh, a, a minimum length path search through a graph, uh, which all of you probably have studied before, hopefully. Uh, you solve this problem through dynamic programming, okay? Or in some, some engineers call it the Viterbi algorithm, but it's the same thing. So you go through, so basically for every node, you say, what is the cost of getting to that node from any, any path, right? So here I only have one path. So the cost of that node is just the, that transition. The cost of that node is just that transition. What is the cost of that node? To det determine the cost of that node, I'm gonna say, which of those two paths has the lowest cost? Is it coming from here? So is it the sum of this and that? So is it the sum of the cost already attached to that node plus the cost of the transition? Or is it the cost I attached to that node plus the cost of that transition? I'm gonna pick the, the smallest of the two and I'm gonna decide the cost of getting to that node is the smallest of those two paths, okay? I'm gonna write this cost here and I'm gonna remember where I came from. Remember that I came from, let's say here, okay? I do the same for this. And then I, get, I go to the next step. Again, here, I have a cost for both of those, accumulated cost for the best path to get to each of those nodes. So the cost to get to that node uh, is the smallest of those two paths, uh, which is the cost of this plus the cost of the transition or the cost of this plus the cost of the transition. Do the same here, do the same here. And then when I, once I get here, I get the, the cost of the sh shortest path, the path with the least cost. And by tracing back uh, you know, for each node, I remember where I came from. So I trace back and I can figure out which path I went through. And that gives me the combination of Z and, and Y that gives me the lowest uh, energy. So this, this algorithm is, is dynamic programming, okay? Is a uh, shortest path in a graph, which I'm sure many of you have studied before. Um, and it's very simple. You go through uh, each step. At each step, you compute the cost by uh, basically adding the, the cost from the, the source nodes, with the cost of the transition and just writing the, the, the smallest of the two or the three or the four or the, or the N that you have, okay? The, the complexity of this algorithm is, you know, essentially uh, order N where N is number of nodes and the number of nodes, you know, depends on the, the, the sort of number of different values that, uh, a combination of values that enter a particular uh, factor in this, uh, in this factor graph. Okay, this type of uh, left, right, uh, graph is called a trellis, by the way. So this process of finding the shortest path in a graph that gives you the lowest energy uh, in speech recognition systems and translation systems and various NLP uh, systems that produce text, this is called a decoder uh, and it's used everywhere. Uh, very often those, those, term he, those terms here actually involve some sort of neural net, okay? So it's not necessarily kind of a simple thing. Okay, let's say um, we talked a little bit about this um, problem and this is gonna be related to a homework. So let's say you want to do, uh, uh, handwriting recognition. Okay, so I wrote a word, it may be a little unreadable. Um, I like this example because it is unreadable. Uh, it's more readable perhaps if I put dots on the eyes. Uh, and I, I give you this example before and I you know, purposely badly drew the, the end, the second end. So um, it looks like an M, <laughs> but it's actually the word minimum, right? With a spelling error, essentially. Um, so how can you do uh, word recognition, uh, which is an example of structure prediction? Um, so this is an example for handwriting, but let's imagine this is a speech signal. Okay, so you have the speech sequence represented as a sequence of vectors that represent a word, okay? Uh, and let's say I have a label here, which is the, co the correct transcription of this. Um, actually, I'll draw this above a little bit. So the correct transcription is uh, M, I, N, 
Um, but I'm actually going to write this in a slightly different manner. Blank I blank N blank I blank. Um, blank U blank M. Okay, so each of those is basically a, a target character, if you want, a category. And I have 26 categories, the 26 letters, and the 27th category, which is none of the above, or blank, if you want, okay? Something that is not a character, something in between. Now, I'm going to run a convolutional net on this, okay? So I'm gonna have this big convolutional net. It's gonna take the whole image, and every output vector, is going to be a list of 26 or 27 scores, if I include blank, uh, energies that indicate uh, the, the, the score of each of the 27 categories for a particular window on the input. Uh, the next vector is going to give scores for a window that's slightly shifted, right? So this is the usual, uh, Convnet trick, right? Etc. Okay, so each of those guys gives me a score for a particular window for what happens in a within a window, uh, you know, roughly in the center of that window. Uh, but it, it looks a little bit of context. Again, if this is a speech signal, those vectors will represent kind of sound categories, um, but they will be able to tell you the sound looking at some context uh, window. This is related to the question that was asked earlier about speech recognition. So we get this sequence of vectors. Um, okay, and I'm gonna draw all of them. Okay, and now it comes time to train the system. How are we gonna train the system? We don't know where the characters are. Someone told us that the word that was written on the input is minimum, so we have the label, but we don't have the location of each of the characters, okay? So we're gonna have a latent variable that's gonna tell us where are the characters. This is very similar to the example I was talking about earlier with Dieter, where we have the list of objects in the image, but we don't know where they are. And the system gives us another list, and it may be in a different order, it may be missing some objects, it may have too many, um, so we need to find a way to kind of match those two things. Same story here. We need to find a way to match the label that we have with the output that our system produces. And that can be done through a latent variable. So uh, again, we're going to appeal to finding the shortest path in a graph and to the Viterbi algorithm or, or in so it's dynamic programming. So we're going to build a graph and I'm not going to draw it as in the form of a graph. I'm going to draw it in the form of a, of a table. And in that table, we're going to fill, we're going to fill a value here with a distance, a measure, a divergence of some kind you know, an energy function uh, between the corresponding vectors uh, at, the, at the corresponding location, right? So uh, the cost for, uh, for, for this cell is gonna be the, or measure of distance between those two, those two things, okay? But we're gonna have another one here, which is distance between those two things. Okay, so we just fill in this matrix with uh, a cost of matching uh, one symbol with, with another or one vector with another. You know, those, those, those can be one hot vectors, for example, right? Um, so for example, an example of such distance would be the, the log of the, uh, right? So if this, this guy is a one hot vector or a category, uh, I, uh, this uh, number here could be the negative log of the score coming out of the corresponding category in this vector, 
okay? Which basically would be the, the, the cross entropy, the usual cross entropy loss, okay? But we could use Euclidean distance, we could use some other energy, I'm not specifying. Something that measures the matches between the two. And now uh, to find the best pairing between the labels and what the system outputs, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to find uh, a path. So we're gonna view each of those uh, uh, elements in the, in, the, in, the in the table, in the array, as a node in a graph. And we're gonna try to find a, a short path in this graph that goes from lower left to upper right and goes through, you know, kind of minimum, uh, basically minimizes the sum of the costs along the path. Okay, perhaps with some proper normalization for the length of the path. And in there, there's gonna be three types of transition, either either we go diagonally or we go vertically or we go horizontally in that, in that transition. If we go diagonally, we say, what we mean is that uh, at one particular location, this guy is associated with this guy. And then if we go diagonally, we say this guy is associated with that guy. Okay, if we go horizontally, it would mean that uh, the label would correspond to multiple vectors here. And that may happen because Let's, let's look at this, uh, this letter M here. It's going to appear, uh, you know, certainly when the, the ConvNet looks at it in the center, this, course, this guy here is gonna say M, of course, right? Uh, but perhaps when you shift it a little bit, it's still going to say M on both sides, okay? So those three guys, in fact, are gonna be M. Um, and so this corresponds to this M here. Uh, hopefully, so what we want here is horizontal transitions that say this M here, this M guy, it's basically those three guys, okay? And the fact that I have three M's here is more evidence for the fact that there is an M. So I don't wanna pay a high price for that, okay? Um, why do I have a blank marker? It's because you know I might want to train the system to, to tell me when the window is sort of in between two characters. I want the system to tell me you are in between two characters and this is not a good character. So I'm not gonna tell you what the character is because I can't say. Why is this important? It's because um, you know uh, this could be mum or this could be a non-English word, mim with two eyes, okay? And so, you know, is it, an, is it a U or is it two I's? Uh, you're gonna have both alternatives. And what is going to tell you whether it's one or the other is the fact that you don't have MIIM as a, as a desired output and it's not in your dictionary. Um, so it can be MIIM. It's not the correct answer, first of all, during training, you're not gonna have that as a target. But then at inference time, what you need to do is figure out simultaneously the shortest path in this graph and the sequence of symbols that minimize the energy. It's easier than you think. Um, but what you have to take into account here is that is the word that I'm recognizing one of the words in my vocabulary, okay? So again, you can, you can be very uh, inefficient about it and just go through the list of all words in your vocabulary and then for each word measure you know, do the shortest path calculation that matches your, your whatever comes out of your ConvNet, and then you get an energy out of it. And you can go through every word in your vocabulary and you will get an energy for every one in your vocabulary and you output the one with the lowest energy, right? That would be a good way of doing it. Fortunately, unfortunately in English, you have something like 200,000 words. So it's not really practical. Um, so the question is, you know, can you have a more efficient way of doing this search? And the answer is yes. And uh, what you need to do is represent the, your vocabulary, not as a list of words, but as, as what's called a tree. Um, and so it's basically, it's basically a tree with two E's that represents all the, 
all the words in the dictionary starting from a node. So you start from a start node and you say, what can be the first letter of any word in my vocabulary? Okay, I have words that begin with A, I have words that begin with B, I have words that begin, you know, pretty much every 26 letter can be the first letter of a word. Um, then what can be the second letter? Well, if I started from A, you know, there's a few words with a double A, but it's pretty rare. So I'm gonna pay a price for putting another A here. If, I have Q, if my first word is a Q and the word is not Arabic, um, the second letter is most likely U because in English, you know, it comes from French. When you have a Q, you have a U afterwards. Uh, so you can build uh, your vocabulary as a tree. And this is basically, uh, so now what you have to do to, you know, basically figure out the, 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 the word that is coming out of your handwriting or speech recognition system is that you have to uh, figure out at the same time a good uh, shortest path together with one of the branches in this uh, dictionary. So let, let me uh, write the, the tree for a very simple uh, set of words uh, where the first letter can be C or can be B and then the second letter can be A or U and the third letter can be let's say T or B and A, T, R, U, T. Okay, I have a few characters. Those are all English words. So if I, any path here is cab, cat, cut, bat, bar, and butt. And those are all English words, right? And they're all represented by this tree. And so what I'm gonna do is simultaneously, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, what can be the first character? It can be C or B, which one has the, uh, you know, I'm, I can compute the energy for, for B and C according to the first character I have here, and I can put those two costs here. Um, so that gives me kind of, you know, two energy values. And then I can do this for the, the next one. And, you know, am I going to the next character and staying, staying on the first one or not? So you can, you know, pretty clearly see that you can find a combination of uh, a path here and a path in this graph that will overall minimize the, the, the energy, which is the sum of those uh, uh, scores over the, over the path. Um, you can, of course, have uh, cost attached to those transitions as well that indicate how likely that word is. So perhaps in your language, cat is very frequent, but cab is less frequent. So you have a higher energy here that will make you pay a price for recognizing cab versus cat because cat is more frequent. Okay. Okay, now we can actually uh, turn this into a slightly more general form. Um, so, so by the way, what I just explained, this is gonna be pretty much directly uh, at the topic of, uh, of a homework, right? Homework three. Uh, so here is a, a more systematic way of, 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 of viewing this. Um, there's a lot of situations where the representation of the hypotheses for what a recognition system does is best represented by a graph. Okay, so I give you some examples here. Uh, the, the, the dictionary, the vocabulary here is represented by a tree, uh, a graph here. And that's, you can think of this as a set of, of, of hypotheses together with energies uh, on them that are, you know, indicated by the cost you put on the transitions. Um, you can think of, of this as a, this matrix here, uh, as a graph with transitions between nodes. The nodes are the, uh, are the elements of the, of the table and the, the transition from one element to the next uh, is like a, an arc in a graph, right? So this is like a grid graph with uh, transitions that can go sideways up or, or, or sideways or in, uh, diagonally. Um, in fact, there is sort of a, a general way of interpreting this where uh, you can think of a, a trainable system, uh, a deep learning system in which the values that are exchanged by the layers are not tensors, but are graphs, okay? Uh, this is not a graph neural net. So there is a concept called graph neural net. There's another concept called graph convolutional net. This is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about here is something called graph transformer networks, uh, which is a different concept. 
But it is one of those concepts where, and this is a very old one, it goes back to the mid 90s. Um, but this is a concept where you represent the, the, the state of the system, not by, not by a tensor or a vector or anything like that inside of a deep learning system, but by a graph where the node and the transitions are attached values to them, energies or images or things like that, tables, whatever. Um, and this is uh, very much the way uh, people working in speech recognition actually um, sort of apprehend this problem. In fact, uh, in PyTorch, there is a library called, uh, called GTN. Uh, uh, and uh, which basically implements this, uh, this idea. Uh, it's very simple. Um, so the, the question is, you know, how do you do backpropagation through a, a deep learning system where the states are graphs? And the answer is, it's kind of relatively simple because the values on those graphs are produced by neural nets. And so you can compute the gradient of whatever it is that you compute on the output with respect to you know, the values that are on those graphs and then back propagate this to all the way through some neural net that produce, produce those values. Um, so let me, give, um, let me go through uh, an example. It may be a little complicated. Um, so you know, bear with me for the next 10 minutes. Um, this is in the context of handwriting recognition uh, and a different type of handwriting recognition system than the one I just mentioned, where instead of having a sliding window over, over the input, uh, there is some sort, of, some sort of heuristic way of deciding where the boundaries between characters might be. This is called a segmenter, right? So you're given a, a handwritten uh, image here and you run this to a, a segmenter, it's a program that you wrote which makes hypothesis about where to cut this into characters. So you can have a cut here, you can have a cut here, you can have a cut here. Um, if each piece is, a, is, is separate, then you build a, a graph with a path that has, has where the, no, the, the links have each of the individual pieces as uh, attached to the, the transitions, okay? So this path says the three is a piece, the left side of the four is a piece and the right side of the four is also a piece, okay? It's not a good segmentation for this sequence, by the way. Uh, but we can construct other paths. So the first path will group the three and the left part of the four together, okay? And then we'll jump over those two components because we, we don't want to reuse that piece twice. And then the next piece is a piece by itself. And then the, uh, the last path, has the three and then the four, and that's the correct path. That would be the correct path for segmentation. But we don't know that yet. Okay, so what do we need to do now? We need to give an energy for each of those paths. Uh, and together we need to give a, an energy also for the, the recognition that we produce. So we're gonna run each of those pieces through a neural net, a convolutional net, let's say. And that convolutional net, each of those convolutional nets run through each of those pieces is gonna give us a list of scores for or energies for each of the categories. Uh, Zero, 0 to 9 if we do digit recognition. So what this guy is going to produce is 10 scores, okay? 10 energies, 0 to 1. And what we're gonna build here is another graph which basically mimics the structure of this graph called the segmentation graph. This is gonna be the interpretation graph where each path now corresponds to a particular interpretation of the input string for a particular segmentation, right? So if I go through this interpretation, three, four, that's the correct interpretation with the correct segmentation. But here is another interpretation, three, two, one. Okay, so it identifies this as three, this as kind of a two, and this as one. Okay, the one has really good energy, point one. Uh, the two has not a so good energy because it's kind of truncated, right? 1.3, um, et cetera. So for each path in the input, I'm gonna have a collection of paths on the output, each of which corresponds to a different interpretation with different labeling, okay? And I didn't draw all 10 of the, of the, of the transitions here because that would be too messy. So I only drew the lowest energy ones, okay? The good candidates. So this could be a three or five, this could be a three or four, this could be a four or two, this could be a four or nine, and this could be a one or a four, something like that, okay? So now I'm gonna run the Viterbi algorithm here on this, uh, uh, on this graph to figure out what is the best answer that my system can produce. 
but I'm training this system so I can tell it what the desired answer is. I'll tell you the, the correct answer is three, four. So whatever path in this graph does not give you the sequence of label three, four is obviously wrong. Okay, so out of this graph, I'm going to select the path that actually say three, four. And that turns out, for this example, it turns out to only be two paths, the correct one, and another one that happens to be incorrect, which has a higher, uh, uh, possibly a higher energy. Um, so I'm finding the best of those two paths through the shortest path algorithm, the Viterbi algorithm, and that gives me this path, which uh, is the correct one. Okay, and I get a score, 0.7 energy. I have the correct path um, because I was given the, the correct sequence and that's the lowest energy path with the correct path. Okay, so you can think of this as a multi-layer network of some kind, a deep learning system, where each of those path selectors here basically selects uh, arcs in the graphs and you can think of them as switches, right? So we've talked about, you know, how we backpropagate through a switch. Uh, so, what we're going to have to do is we want to make this energy as low as possible because that's the energy of the correct answer. So if we want to train our system using something like a contrastive loss, we want to make the energy of the correct answer as low as possible and the energy of the incorrect answer is larger. Um, so here is the energy of the correct answer is 0.7. We can backpropagate gradient through this entire chain to go back to the weights of our neural net so that we change the weights of the neural net so that this number goes down. How do we do this? Well, this number is just the sum of this number and that number. So if we have a gradient of our loss, uh, the gradient of our loss with respect to itself is one. And so the gradient of this number with respect to that number is also one because this is just the sum of this and that. And with respect to that also one. Now here we have this number that appears here and that number does not appear here. So when we backpropagate through this transformer here to the shortest pass selection, uh, the gradient is going to be one for this number, but zero for that because it doesn't appear uh, up there. Okay, then again, here we have another path selector that selected the desired path. Uh, many of those transitions did not appear anywhere. So their cost would be zero. Okay. Uh, but then some do appear, and so their, their gradient is going to be plus one. Like, for example, this guy, okay? It appears in the correct path, and when I backpropagate, I get plus one. Now, some others are minus one and zero. Ignore this for the time being. Um, and so, again, I can backpropagate again the gradient. Or, uh, these are the outputs of the neural net, the different instances of the same neural net. So I can backpropagate through the neural net and get a gradient with respect to the weights of this overall thing. So I've, you know, basically backpropagated through this structure. This is what the GTN library does for you, right? If you want to use it. Um, oh, there are a couple of questions. Question. Yep. Uh, so the, the library is DGN. Uh, also the- GTN, GTN, like this. Graph transformer networks. Oh, okay. Uh, so the, there is a question, why there are two edges between two nodes in the interpretation graph? Well, there should be 10 of them, but I only drew two. There should be 10 of them because there are 10 categories, right? There are 10 different categories to go from this node to that node that correspond to this. Each of the 10 categories, zero to nine, has a score produced by this neural net that looks at it, okay? This neural net has 10 outputs and it produces a vector of 10 outputs and I represent them by uh, 10 uh, transitions with 10 different energies and 10 different labels from zero to nine. But because I don't have space, I only drew two of them. And the other question is, so when we do inference on your validation set, we kick off the path selector and say our word is the one with the lowest path, right? right. Yeah, so I only explain here how we do this when we know the design answer. So this is during training. I'm coming to the inference when we don't have the answer, okay? So this is for okay. inference when we are not given the correct answer here, okay? So there I run through my neural net. I have this interpretation graph. It's the same as before. And then I just compute the shortest path in that, in that graph, okay? Uh, it happens to be this one. So it happens to be the one that is at the top here in this particular example. And I compute a score, an energy, and my energy is 0.6 for this. This energy is necessarily smaller than the other one that I got uh, when I gave the desired answer because this one is constrained, right? The, the path with the lowest energy is somewhere in, in this graph and I selected uh, 
uh, other paths, it may or may not be in that, you know, it, the, the, the best path may or may not be in the correct answer. In this case, it's not. So when I let the system to its own devices and I let it figure out the shortest um, path in that graph, it comes up with a graph that is incorrect with the labels, the labeling three, four, one. Okay, so it thinks this is a three, this is a four, this is a one, and it's the best overall uh, answer. And it gets a low energy. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to clamp, I'm going to plug the 0.7 I got here, which is the score of the good guy, which I want to be small, and this guy, which is the score of the bad guy, okay? And I want it to be large. Okay, I can force this answer to be wrong, by the way, right? So if I want to generate a bad guy for contrastive training, uh, I can have a path selector here that only selects the, the paths that have the wrong answer. But I'm not doing this here, I'm just getting the best possible answer, okay? Um, so my cost function is gonna be the difference between those two scores. In this case, it's a very simple loss function. It's a difference between the, the score constrained to produce the correct answer, okay, the energy, which I want to make as low as possible. So this is the energy of the good guy, or the, the good Y, this is Y, right? So I give an X and a Y, I get an energy, I wanna make that small. And then I have an X, I produce the Y, it could be a Y hat, so a Y that is incorrect, that I force to be incorrect. In this case, I don't force it to be incorrect. Uh, and this is the energy of the bad guy, it's 0.6. And what I want is this 0.6 to be larger than this 0.7. Okay, so I'm gonna push down on this guy, push up on this guy. So the simple way to do this, I'm gonna compute the difference between them. And that's gonna be my loss function, the difference between those two scores. It could be a hinge loss that pushes on the bad guy, uh, you know, up to a certain point. Here it's just a difference, you know, it's within the linear part of the hinge, let's say. Um, and then I'm gonna have to backpropagate gradient to this entire structure to get the gradient of that loss with respect to the weights in the neural net. Okay, so we already seen how we can backpropagate gradient to this half, okay? Whatever number here appears uh, in the, contributes to the output will have a gradient of one, okay? The contribution, so, you know, this path here appears here and that cost contributes additively to this guy and additively to that guy. So the gradient of the loss here with respect to that value here is plus one, which is indicated in parentheses here. This one is zero because it doesn't appear. All right, all the other ones are zero also because they don't appear. But I also have to backpropagate through this end and this guy has a minus sign. So uh, where the gradient is one here, one side, I go through this minus sign, my gradient now is minus one. So the gradient of the loss with respect to whatever comes out of, of, of this plus is actually minus one because of this, this minus here. Uh, those contribute additively. So each of those guys has a gradient of minus one. The gradient of the loss with respect to each of those numbers is minus one. Uh, again, I can go through the Viteri transformer. So the corresponding nodes here are gonna have a minus one contributed to their, um, to their gradient, but I have two, two gradients coming from the top. I have one gradient coming from here, one gradient coming from here. And those gradients are either plus one, minus one, or zero. They're minus one if they come from here, they're plus one if they come from here, or they're zero if uh, the paths don't appear anywhere. Now, this path, uh, this path, for example, okay, appears in both, both sides. So the plus one that comes down here and the minus one that comes down from here are gonna cancel, and so, the gradient with respect to this guy here is gonna be zero. This path here is, is wrong. Okay, this transition is wrong. It appears in the wrong answer, but it does not appear in the correct answer. So it's gonna have a contribution from the right. And so it's gonna get a gradient of minus one. Same for this guy, because it's also path, uh, part of the wrong path. This guy on the other hand is in the desired path and does not appear in the, in the wrong path. And so its gradient is gonna be plus one. What does that mean? This means I'm going to try to make, when I backpropagate through this, this means I'm going to try to make this energy smaller, okay? Give a higher score for four, basically, at that location. And I'm going to try to make this energy larger. So this is a bad one, okay? It looks like a good one, but it's actually not a one. It's the left part of a four. So I'm going to try to make this energy higher. And I'm going to try to make this energy higher because this is a terrible four as well. And then this guy, it was part of the good answer, so I'm, I'm not gonna do anything to it. 
Okay, so once you backpropagate to this uh, output of this neural net and then to the weight, the effect on this neural net is going to be to uh, boost, to basically inhibit the score of this one, to tell it like, you know, you're not a good one. Uh, tell this guy you're not a good four and tell this guy you're a very good four, your energy should be lower. That's gonna be the effect. You update the weights and that's, that's gonna be the effect of it. So overall, what this comes down to is that you have been telling the system, here is the correct answer, three, four. I don't know where the characters are, but I'm basically minimizing with respect to a latent variable, which is the association between the labels and the, and the, the candidate proposals on the input. And I'm doing this by basically minimizing with respect to a latent variable, which, is, which turns into a path in a graph, okay? So I'm finding, I'm trying to find the shortest path in the graph. So this is a general form of the spatial case I described earlier using this diagram where this was a simple case. In fact, the very first speech recognition systems, uh, there's a, a famous uh, Japanese paper by uh, Sakori and Chiba from the 1970s where they used this technique called dynamic time warping to actually do speech recognition, okay? They didn't use backpropagation, they didn't train the system this way, but, um, but that's, you know, basically they, they use this sort of shortest path in the graph. And since then it's been completely generalized to this idea of graph transformer uh, in speech recognition about 20 some odd years ago, 25 years ago or so, uh, through work by Fernando Pereira and Mary Amori, who is actually at NYU um, on uh, uh, finite state uh, transducers, which is kind of a generalized form of this. And uh, what we did in the late nineties, in the, in the mid nineties was to uh, essentially realize that you could use those, uh, those you know, search uh, uh, shortest path uh, uh, decoder systems and, and backpropagate gradient to them. So you could do global training of a speech recognition or handwriting recognition system at the sentence level or the, the, the word level uh, without having to specify where the individual characters were. So you do simultaneous segmentation and recognition without having to specify the segmentation during supervision. Uh, so I'll end here with this uh, simple example that shows how you can use operations on graph. So if you have an interpretation graph where each path is a possible interpretation for an input sentence, and you have a tree um, basically representing where each path represents a legal sequence of characters in the form of a tree, uh, you can combine those two graphs to find the, the path that are common to this graph and that graph and, and, and give them the, the corresponding cost in this, in this path, right? So you do the intersection, it's called the composition, but it's the intersection between those two graphs where what you extract from it are the, the paths that are common that exist in both graphs, okay? And you just propagate the costs that are on the transitions to the result. So here what you have is a new graph that uh, is labeled by the, you know, by, by the, the characters uh, all of them are legal sequences of the characters that come out of the grammar. And the costs here are the energies that were extracted from this. So you do a shortest pass in this graph and you get the best answer that simultaneously is grammatically correct. And this is really how uh, speech recognition works. Uh, this search, by the way, is exactly how your predictive spelling correction on, you know, on, on the web or your keyboard actually works. There is, you know, probabilities or, or scores attached to each of those transitions and you know, it tries to figure out what, you, what you're likely to type next. Uh, so you can put this all together into a giant system and you can recognize checks. And this was done in the late nineties and it worked really well. This was probably the, the, the first kind of large scale applications of commercial nets for a practical commercial applications. Okay, and that would be for another time. Thank you very much. And we see each other on tomorrow for the training of EBMs in the in the lab in the practicum part. All right. So see you everyone tomorrow. Bye bye. All right. <laughs>